we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just want to say hello to everyone. Thanks for being here. I think I know a lot of you, but for those who don't know me, I am Catherine Calhoun Cutshaw, um, the collections manager in the North Carolina room. And like last week, I'll point out that I actually got to be here today, which is great. Um, it's nice actually being in the library after such a long time. Um, this is a series of programs we're doing virtually called Zoom with the North Carolina Room. Um, and we're really glad that you're here. Let your friends know, um, folks, other interested parties, share it around on Facebook. Um, you know, stats are what the library lives on. And uh, right now we have almost no stats. So folks come into programs um, and showing that they are interested in all the things that the library has to offer. Um, is really great. You can check out your local branch libraries. A lot of them are doing book clubs and other kind of programming like I'm doing here today. So um, see what you can do while you're hanging out at home. Um, today, we're actually doing the program that we plan to do today, but in the evening in the Lord Auditorium. Um, but we're here virtually and we're going to do it basically the exact same way that we would um, I'm going to introduce Dan. Dan's going to talk for a couple of, or a few minutes. Um, he's got a PowerPoint and then we'll have some time at the end for question and answer. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Dan Pierce. He is a professor of history at UNC Asheville. Do you have a name chair, Dan? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> It's uh, Interdisciplinary Distinguished Professor of the Mountain South. Ooh, so very <laughs> schnazzy title. Um, that's long for resident hillbilly is what <laughs> he's often called. <laughs> um, and Dan was um, definitely um, one of the most important people in my undergraduate and graduate career, um, teaching Appalachian history and um, North Carolina history and being my thesis advisor twice. So um, if I dislike him now, I should have said it earlier. Um, <laughs> but I love Dan. So um, Dan is the author of many books. I'm going to show off the ones that we have here in the North Carolina collection. His first is The Great Smokies here from National Habitat to National Park. This is his dissertation uh, project that he turned into a book. My favorite and very important in my life um, is Real NASCAR. Um, this book is awesome. Um, I don't think anyone had taken a, a scholarly look at NASCAR before um, and was one of those books that helped me learn that it's okay to be who I am and where I'm from and that there's uh, academic importance in that as well. So Real NASCAR, White Lightning and Red Clay, and Big Bill France. Corn from a Jar, the first work on moonshine itself, and it's a nice short little, short little read. You can get through this in about, oh, an hour or two. Hazel Creek, um, the subtitle of this is The Life and Death of an Iconic Mountain Community. So for folks who are interested in the Fontana area of the Smokies, for folks who are really interested in the Smokies, um, and just love awesome art. Um, this one here is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, an illustrated guide, and the Anderson Design Group did these really wonderful images. Um, they're based out of Knoxville, and they're like Great Depression era um, National Park posters, and, and they're just really cool. This is a fun book to just look at. And then, of course, for what we're here for today, the newest release, what did this come out, October, Dan? Yeah. Okay. October of this year, Far Hill Lightning. So, um, Dan is a, whoo, I just dropped some books, a prophetic writer. Um, and like I said earlier, the resident hillbilly at UNC Asheville. So, without further ado, Dan Pierce, everybody. Uh, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> uh, and it's good to be here. Virtually, this is becoming my life. My life is being li lived on Zoom. Uh, lately, so uh, I don't know if that's been the case for you, but uh, I think I've got an, at least one Zoom thing every day this week, so uh, uh, that's kind of where I am. But it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, and uh, first off, let me uh, and, and it's uh, fun to be uh, talking uh, to a group that 
you know, that cares about this region. Uh, but also to, uh, that includes three people that were uh, very much a part of the, uh, of the research and writing on this book. And so Gene Hyde, uh, and uh, I won't go into the story about how Gene uh, contributed, almost contributed to my divorce, but uh, that's, a, that's a good one. And it involves moonshine, <laughs> a moonshine still. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and uh, Catherine and the work in the North Carolina room and uh, all the wonderful images I got from them. And then Ashley McGee, who happened to be our departmental assistant at the time, who, who did all kinds of wonderful things and particularly getting permissions for just about all the images and proofreading and doing all kinds of stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm forever in their debt. And so uh, uh, it's, it's fun to be here. So uh, <clears throat> let me jump into the thing. Well, let me talk first just a little bit about um, how this is going to play out. This, this, this PowerPoint is basically about um, misconceptions about moonshine in North Carolina. Uh, and um, one of the fun things or the thing that I find the most fun about being a historian and, and fascinating is that whenever you go into a research project, it's um, one of the things that you always find is that um, we always learn new things and it's never exactly what you expect it to be. Uh, and so we all have a lot of preconceptions about moonshine and moonshiners. Uh, and one of the things that, um, you know, again, was most fun about doing this research was to find that, you know, so many of those are just flat out wrong. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. There's a lot in this book that I think is fun. One of the really neat things, uh, UNC press has did a phenomenal job and, and actually my friend Joel Anderson uh, and the Anderson Design Group did the cover art. And uh, so there's a lot of neat things there, but um, you know, they let me do a lot of sidebars and uh, people seem to really enjoy those um, in the book. Uh, but, um, but let me jump to the, uh, to the PowerPoint and, and talk about, uh, if I can do this uh, successfully. Go through all the steps here and uh, start. So there, there you see the wonderful Anderson Design Group uh, cover art. There, uh, they do such a such a great job. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, and you see the title: How Secret Steals and Fast Cars Made North Carolina the Moonshine Capital World. So I do have people that that debate with me about whether that's true or not, and it's it, it's something that you can't exactly prove. Uh, but uh, it is, um, um, you know, based on the uh, uh, federal, uh, the Treasury Department statistics, uh, you know, North Carolina was all, uh, you know, really from the 1870s up until the 1970s, uh, at least, North Carolina was, uh, you know, one of the top states, you know, first or second most years. Uh, in terms of steals busted and people arrested and uh, sent to federal penitentiaries and stuff like that. So, uh, but anyway, so again, there are a lot of surprising things <clears throat> that I learned along the way. And um, wh one of those, and this is a North Carolina book, um, <clears throat> was this notion that uh, we have about moonshine being a mountain thing. Uh, and we have this, I love this, this postcard and actually the original, uh, photograph, I think that this came from is in the North Carolina collection. Uh, is that right, Catherine? That's, <laughs> she's, she's typing in here. So, um, anyway, um, but I love that image. It was actually taken by George Massa, the photographer. And uh, I, I made a strange discovery about this and that the, the, the person on the left, uh, this is a posed uh, a photograph. These aren't actual moonshiners, at least to my knowledge. Uh, but the person on the left is Bascom Lamar Lunsford, uh, who, you know, which is, uh, you know, kind of interesting given the fact that uh, Lunsford, um, kind of, uh, well, um, that's a long story too, but, but wrote the uh, song, Good Old Mountain Dew. 
and uh, is, is probably the best known of the songs that that he uh, recorded, and then that was picked up by by others later on. Uh, but um, but we do have this image. This is kind of our stereotypical image of the moonshiner, and of course this is uh, this postcard went everywhere, and it was like it was a typical moonshine still in Kentucky or Tennessee or Georgia uh, or North Carolina or wherever but um uh, or in the mountains and uh, uh that's our our image of that but that's not uh when you look at north carolina and moonshine in north carolina <clears throat> you find that moonshine is all over the state uh this is actually an image of a place which is maybe oh gosh uh, well less than 30 miles probably maybe 15 uh, miles from uh, uh, from uh, Manio uh, on the coast uh, in the uh, alligator swamp. Uh, it's called Buffalo City. Uh, and Buffalo City during uh, Prohibition um, was called the moonshine capital of the world. I mean, we usually think of, uh, you know, if you're going to call some place in, in North Carolina the moonshine capital of the world, um, you you would generally think of Wills County uh, or some county in the West, um, but in reality, uh, you know, Buffalo City was uh, exporting huge amounts not in not in fast cars or trucks or anything like that, but on boats uh, out of the region during Prohibition and all up and down the East Coast. Uh, very famous. Um, product that they had there called East Lake Rye, uh, which was kind of unusual in terms of the, of the recipe. There's a lot of variety there too, but they use rye uh, in their liquor. And I actually was down in Elizabeth City giving a talk uh, back in January. And I, <coughs> I met a couple there, um, a lawyer there, and they invited us to their house. And he had some um, some East Lake rye from the 1930s. Uh, he had some left and I got a taste of that East Lake rye, which was, you know, for moonshine uh, related stuff, it's, it, it, it was really good. Uh, so uh, don't tell my mother that, but uh, uh, it was really good. But uh, so you had uh, in the Eastern part of North Carolina, also in the, uh, in the uh, coastal plain, there are plenty uh, um, Robinson County, uh, which is uh, the, the heart of Lumbee country, uh, was a huge moonshine area, not too far up the road from there, right on the edge of the coastal plain and the, uh, <clears throat> and the um, uh, Piedmont. Johnston County was huge, uh, getting up in the Piedmont, Chatham County, uh, every county really in North Carolina had significant presence of of moonshine. So this is something that's all over the state. So it's not just Western North Carolina and it's important everywhere. And the reason for that is, is really the economics of moonshine is that uh, for so many people, this was one dependable way that they could earn some income. And particularly if you're in rural areas, there were not a lot of economic opportunities. You couldn't really make a living off the farm. You had to find ways to supplement your income. And, um, uh, and uh, this was one of the chief ways that you could do it. And the fact that you had uh, uh, really, in most of the state, you had legal prohibition um, on either the state, the federal, or the local level into the 1970s. And again, I mean, well, Graham County still has an, an old fort, right, Ashley? Uh, except for this new weird thing that's going on with the brewery there. But, uh, um, but um, you know, still have prohibition. And so there's always been a market for it. And, um, uh, and it's a, you know, it's a fascinating uh, uh, thing here. So, uh, so again, it's all over the state. Uh, and then another thing, part of our stereotype is what a moonshiner looks like or who a moonshiner is. And it's a mountaineer and, uh, uh, usually with a shooting iron uh, somewhere nearby and and a hound dog, uh, but uh, uh, with a beard uh, most likely and a funny hat of some kind and uh, overalls. 
uh, those are kind of the standard um, of, um, of what a moonshiner is. And of course, if you recognize that individual on the left there is Popcorn Sutton. Uh, Popcorn played the part uh, masterfully. And, um, and to uh, his, his uh, profit and fame, uh, but, um, but that's our image of who a moonshiner is, is that it's some, some older uh, mountaineer uh, guy uh, up in a rhododendron uh, hell somewhere, you know, uh, at, the, at the head of a creek. Uh, but again, we see it's all over North Carolina. Uh, but also when we, you really start looking at who uh, the people involved in the moonshine business were, there were all kinds of people. And um, uh, there were women. There were significant numbers of women in the moonshine business. I love, I, I found this image of this uh, young woman in the bonnet, uh, of all places on the uh, Library of Congress uh, website of their free images, which I just, I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't, I couldn't find, I assume it was probably an advertising image of some kind, but it's just perfect. Um, but, uh, you know, lots of women, um, uh, lots of, in North Carolina, uh, because we have the largest, uh, if you didn't realize that, the largest population of Native Americans uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, we have significant numbers of Native Americans, both uh, Lumbee and Cherokee, more Lumbee than Cherokee, uh, but, um, but significant numbers there in the moonshine business. And um, in the top left, this uh, picture of uh, Howard Creech from Johnston County, uh, African Americans. Uh, just, just briefly, how those tied into the moonshine business. For women, um, of course, a lot of it was, you know, moonshine was often a family business and, um, and you could trust family members not to uh, uh, turn you in or cause problems for you. And so um, women were involved in that respect, often as, as lookouts or helpers at stills or, or sometimes the moonshiners themselves. The big thing I found with women in lots of cases, moonshine involvement in moonshine, particularly selling moonshine, was um, was kind of a social welfare part of the social welfare safety net in rural communities, particularly for women who were um, uh, widows, divorced, had been abandoned by their husband, and particularly if they had small children, it was a perfectly acceptable thing in a lot of communities uh, for these women to sell, uh, to sell moonshine often out the back of their, their door. The woman on the left, this is kind of a fanciful portrait, is uh, Rhoda Lowry, who was uh, the, uh, the wife of uh, the famous Lumbee, uh, either outlaw or freedom fighter, however you want to look at him, uh, uh, Henry Barry Lowry. But uh, uh, Henry Barry Lowry, died, disappeared, uh, you know, it's kind of like Elvis in some ways, there are people that say he's still alive uh, in the um, 1870s, but uh, she had small children and to help keep body and soul together, she sold liquor and actually was uh, found an account of her being busted and sent to jail, which is another thing about women that was, uh, that led a lot of women into it, was that, um, you know, most uh, jails and, and, uh, local jails weren't really equipped to have women. And so in many cases, the judge would, uh, would, uh, when they went to court, the judge would basically say, you know, well, if you promise not to do this anymore, you can go on home and, and, uh, uh tend your children. And so that was, um, again, lots and lots of women, I'm just amazed at the numbers of women involved in the moonshine business with native Americans, particularly with the Lumbee, uh, you know, one of the interesting things I found is that the original moonshiners in North Carolina, the people making illegal liquor, uh, were African Americans and Native Americans. Um, and that was because it was perfectly legal, except for that short period when Alexander Hamilton screwed up and, uh, and uh, pushed through an excise tax on whiskey that led to the Whiskey Rebellion. But in North Carolina, it was widely ignored the whole federal excise tax during that period, but that went away in 18, 
1801 when Jefferson became president. It's one of the reasons he got elected. But uh, in North Carolina in the 1830s, uh, they, uh, the legislature passed a law outlawing uh, free persons of color from making, uh, from making liquor. And so it was perfectly legal. Uh, they outlawed it uh, for, again, um, African Americans and Native Americans who were free. And uh, although there was lots of slave distilling going on, that was another really interesting finding uh, 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 that I found um, about how much of uh, how, how many plantations had uh, distilleries. It was huge. Uh, but anyway, so the African Americans they didn't quit making it because they needed the income uh, that they made. For you know, most small farmers supplemented their income by making liquor. And so they continued to make it illegally. So they were the original moonshiners in North Carolina. So African Americans and Native Americans uh, in doing that. Um, uh, also with the Lumbee in particular, it was kind of part of their rebellion in some ways. The, the, the Lumbee have a long history of, uh, of, of uh, kind of a resistance uh, to, um, to, white to, to the oppressive uh, uh, system that they found themselves on and, and finding creative ways to do that. And one of those was a long tradition of, of making liquor illegally. Uh, and with African-Americans, uh, it uh, in most of the African-Americans, or most of the moonshine made in the eastern part of North Carolina was made by African-Americans. They generally did not own the still, although there, were, there are cases of um, African-American moonshine kingpins in that area, but they generally worked as Howard Creech did in kind of a sharecropping arrangement to where some um, um, white person with means supplied the, um, uh, the still and the, uh, and the uh, corn and the uh, sugar and whatever else they're using in, uh, uh, to make their mash. Uh, and they did the labor and did the delivery and, and took most of the risk. The, uh, the white owners rarely uh, went to the still themselves, but these African-Americans uh, did the labor, took the risk, uh, went to jail. The white owner often then would, um, would hire a lawyer for them, support their family maybe while they were in, in jail or prison. But it was very much along the lines of a share of the, of the sharecropping system, and so and it fit uh, nicely into that. But again, um, very significant numbers. And then the other thing that a lot of the 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 uh, retailing, in particular, of moonshine was done by African Americans, even in the western part of the state, um, because particularly after World War II, the big market for Moonshine was in African American communities, and so it was uh, much more common there. So, again, it's a very uh, you know it's across the board really in North Carolina uh, that you see this involvement in the moonshine business with you know really um, every demographic you know and also children <laughs> as well as the, as the need may arise. <clears throat> Uh, this, I, I, I'll, I'll skip through this, but uh, b because this was a, a hotbed and there are lots of, actually, uh, I did a thing um, called the uh, North Carolina Moonshine Hall of Fame as part of the sidebars and, uh, and uh, a good many of them are from Western North Carolina. These are what I call celebrity moonshiners. Uh, and there, that, that kind of weird pink picture there is of Amos Owens, who is from Rutherford County. Uh, who was called the Cherry Bounce King, but he was, you know, pretty famous guy. He was uh, uh, actually a biography done of him uh, in the early years of the 20th century. He was quite a character. That probably that biography probably needs to be republished because it is highly uh, entertaining. Um, and uh, but also. Um, um, the uh, famous outlaw Lewis Redman was uh, some of you may have heard of him before was another one of these famous Western North Carolina moonshiners. He uh, was from Transylvania County, went down into the upstate and started a kingdom there really where he terrorized federal authorities <laughs> in many ways. Uh, and then when the heat got too hot, he went up into Swain County where he was eventually 
captured. He was uh, sent to prison in New York and to the same prison that Amos Owen served uh, three terms in. And, um, uh, and later uh, was uh, through the uh, influence of Wade Hampton, who was a South Carolina governor and then U.S. senator, um, was pardoned uh, by, I believe it was Chester Arthur, I believe, that, uh, uh, that pardoned him. And he came back in a triumphal procession to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, finished out his days in the upstate of South Carolina, working at a legal distillery. And there's actually uh, uh, some of the new, uh, quote, legal moonshine uh, named after him uh, uh, today. Another one, Quill Rose, was another one that's featured. Um, but Lewis Redman had several uh, biographies written of him, dime novels, featured in the New York Times. Uh, Quill Rose and others. So uh, these were all Western North Carolina figures. So long traditions, and of course, going up uh, into the present day. And we'll we'll uh, talk about that. So another uh, kind of misconception about moonshine and uh, its relationship in in uh, society is this kind of relationship with religion, particularly evangelical religion, and uh, and moonshine, and we particularly think about this in connection with uh, Baptist and that uh, Baptists are teetotalers. And uh, my mother, uh, my I'm, I'm the son of a Southern Baptist minister, and uh, uh, you know w my family is uh, about uh, my mother in particular about as she's about as teetotaling as you can be. Uh, uh, and uh, my dad, who's uh, passed away years ago was the same way and uh and uh, and he did um uh, uh you know and he preached frequently <laughs> against alcohol and uh, he, he did have enough integrity to where he really wanted to say that the uh, that what jesus did at that wedding was uh to turn that water uh into uh, uh grape juice but uh but he knew enough greek to know that 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 wasn't the case, but he, he, he tried to skate around that <laughs> in some way, you know, but, you know, totally anti, uh, alcohol of any kind. Um, I will share, uh, I, I actually, there's a new, uh, meme out there on Facebook. I don't know if any of you have seen it that, uh, actually from the Babylon B, if you're familiar with that, uh, satirical kind of a evangelical satirical website, you know, kind of strange, but, um, but they had this this meme about how uh, Baptists were loving the fact that you could now go to the liquor store in a mask, and uh, uh, and so <laughs> and not be recognized. You know, that's the there's an old joke about Baptist blindness. You know, is that that's the inability of a of a, a Baptist to recognize a a, a fellow Baptist uh, in the liquor store or at the uh, bootleggers. Uh, play so, but we have that image about Baptists being being total uh, uh, absolute teetotalers and anti moonshine. But it, you know, one of the interesting things that I found, particularly in rural communities and rural Baptist churches, um, was that uh, pastors were pretty careful because um, there were plenty of people in their congregations who were good church attenders and and good tithers who. Um, uh, who um, were involved in the moonshine business. In fact, uh, in thinking about my Hall of Fame, three of my Hall of Famers have big Baptist uh, uh, connections. Uh, the one on the left here is Percy Flowers, who may be, you know, about other than Junior Johnson, maybe the most famous moonshiner in North Carolina history. He, he was profiled in the uh, Saturday Evening Post in the 1950s and was allegedly making over a million dollars in the moonshine business a year. Never, uh, he was convicted of contempt of court, but was never busted for moonshining and uh, was always able. But but um, uh, Percy was, um, I don't know that he actually attended church, but he was a member of the White Oak Baptist Church. His, his wife was a Sunday school teacher and very active in the church. And uh, he was a heavy giver to the church. And um, uh, uh, and whenever he was in court, uh, it was almost a, it was a guarantee that the pastor of that church was going to come and testify to the good character of Percy Flowers. Uh, so again, you, you know, 
uh, and uh, uh, flowers probably help keep that church financially viable in many ways. Popcorn Sutton um, was uh, his grandfather, uh, according to Popcorn, built the first Baptist church on Hemp Hill up above uh, Maggie Valley um, with uh, proceeds from a, a load of liquor. And uh, uh, Popcorn uh, was once quoted uh, Don um, Dudenbostel, who's a excellent East Tennessee photographer who did some really iconic photographs of Popcorn Sutton, um, once called up Popcorn and said he wanted to come out and uh, do, do a photo shoot uh, on a Sunday morning and, and was that okay with Popcorn? And Popcorn's response was, hell no, God damn it, it's Sunday morning, I'll be in church. Uh, so, <laughs> again, you get this kind of interesting uh, Jim Tom Hedrick, which some of you may know if you've ever seen the Moonshiner show uh, on Discovery Channel. Uh, also, uh, he, he first uh, gained a little bit of fame in a documentary back about 2000 um, uh, called Moonshine. And, uh, and uh, that, that show shows him going to Wednesday night prayer meeting. He knows the word to every song. And, uh, and actually ends with him, he, he was a uh, notorious dumpster diver, but he found a lap organ in a dumpster one time and it shows him playing on his lap organ, what a friend we have in Jesus. And so, so it's a complicated relationship, you know, between the Baptist and moonshiners, particularly when you get into rural areas that, uh, you know, where uh, churches were often dependent uh, on these moonshiners to, to uh, build buildings, to paint buildings, to uh, uh, upkeep them, to pay the pastor, that type of thing. And these often, a lot of these moonshiners were good tithers. Uh, so, uh, and good church uh, attenders, you know, uh, despite their uh, chosen profession. Uh, <clears throat> one of the fun things I, I did, I, I've always been a big fan of Andy Griffith. And uh, I had, and actually, right where I am right now is where I generally write. And actually it was right here that I had this epiphany. I was thinking about in the last stages of the book about who I dedicate the book to. And I, um, I dedicated one to my wife and one to my parents and one to my children and uh, one to a friend and, uh, uh, and one to my academic mentors at one time. And so I thought, I was thinking, well, I, I just won't have a dedication. And, uh, but when I write lots of times, I'll have the TV on. I generally write in the mornings and I usually have it turned to uh, uh, TV land and they, they show between nine and 11 o'clock, they'll show about four episodes of the Andy Griffith show. And so I'll, uh, I may not be paying close attention, but it's on in the background. And so it just kind of hit me uh, about Andy Griffith's connections to all this and so, uh, so I ended up dedicating the book to uh, Andy Griffith, which I kind of feel uh, proud about in some ways because I think it's it, it was appropriate. Um, and you know, and and one of the things I do in the book is look at a lot of the popular culture. Um, you know how popular culture relates to moonshine in North Carolina and the music and the uh, um, uh, the jokes, the poetry, the uh, the prose, the uh, souvenirs that were made, the folk art, uh, all kinds of things related to this. And of course, one of the big things are the movies and television shows. I mean, so many movies connected with Moonshine in North Carolina, uh, but probably most famously the Andy Griffith Show. And, and most of these images uh, that you see uh, in movies and television shows are pretty stereotypical. But one thing that's really uh, that I found fascinating was that Andy Griffith was uh, in lots of ways uh, really understood moonshine. Uh, and of course he grew up in, in uh, uh, Stokes County, right? Uh, in uh, Mount Airy. And, uh, uh, and there are plenty, plenty of moonshine in that area. Uh, and uh, he obviously absorbed some of this growing up, but there are several things that he, he, he gets very right. One, he gets uh, uh, right the uh, relationship between um, moonshiners and uh, law enforcement. Uh, 
uh, and we think about the shootouts and all that type of thing that uh, that did occur on occasions, but for the most part, it was a relatively amicable relationship between uh, particularly local law enforcement because these people had to run for re-election. Uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't want to alienate too many people in the community and they and a lot of people depended economic, uh, 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 economically on moonshine. And uh, so he, he uh, you see that in several episodes where Andy lets, uh, you know, uh, uh, people go to say, well, I'll let you out, you know, so you can go harvest your crops or, or uh, so you can be at home for Christmas with your family or something like that. So there, that was uh, a, a common thing in a lot of uh, places. I love the, uh, there's one episode where uh, actually it's the one that's pictured here um, uh, with uh, I can't remember their names, Claire Bell and uh, um, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, uh, these women moonshiners. But uh, there, there's a scene where they're busting uh, Rafe Hollister still, and Rafe um, takes a shot at them. You know, he doesn't know who they are, and then and then they say, "Oh, it's Andy and Barney," and says, "Oh." come on in guys, you know, and I'm just, you know, making a run of liquor here or something like that. And, and uh, Andy says something about, you know, well, we're here to arrest you. He said, why is that? He says, uh, oh, oh, his first thing he says, I thought you was the law. And uh, he said, well, we are the law. He says, no, that, that mean federal kind. You know? <laughs> so he, he had no idea they were there to arrest him because they're the local people, you know, and, and why should they be concerned with that? So again, another accurate thing. And then the depiction of women moonshiners, uh, you know, in, in this case, these two, uh, what they used to call old maids and, uh, you know, who again are women without male, uh, male financial supporters. And again, uh, you know, it's an accurate kind of thing. No, well, again, all this is played for laughs, of course, but it is, it is one of the few depictions that you see in the popular culture of, of women involved in moonshine. And again, it's an accurate idea that, um, you know, that women like this may be making moonshine to, uh, to uh, supplement their income. So again, a lot there in the Andy Griffith show that's, uh, that's fun, uh, but also pretty historically accurate. And then the last uh, uh, thing, uh, you know, we have this, this notion about moonshine uh, being, um, you know, a vestige of our past in North Carolina. And uh, famously, a uh, documentary uh, was made about Popcorn Sutton called The Last One, uh, which showed on PBS and kind of helped turn him into a, a, uh, 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 not only a national but international celebrity and <clears throat> in some ways and of course popcorn really liked to uh emphasize that and and he you know he says repeatedly throughout this and and in his book and in uh, some other videos that he made that he was the last of the old time uh moonshiners and uh, you know which actually popcorn played that to the hilt i kind of call i call popcorn the a postmodern moonshiner because he was a moonshiner uh, playing the role of a moonshiner and he played it to the hilt. In fact, uh, this whole image behind is, is, is really uh, a fabrication about how he made moonshine because that's not accurate at all because he was making it in thousand gallon stills in, the, in barns and places like that. And he had several of them scattered around. Uh, all over East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. But, uh, but again, we have that image that this is a dying art and this is something that is, uh, that is a vestige of the past. Uh, but uh, it's pretty amazing, you know, in getting looking at this, it's pretty amazing that, um, um, that you know, how um, long lasting this is into the modern era and how particularly in the last 20 years, there has been a real revival in the moonshine business. And there's several things that have happened there. One, it was the popcorn uh, Sutton phenomenon itself, uh, his popularity and Jim Tom Hedrick, and then the rise of the uh, moonshiner show and, and uh, this kind of ongoing thing in the popular culture 
uh, with moonshine and, and in some, um, you know, in a number of movies, uh, uh, that have come out, you know, that moonshine has, uh, uh, and television shows, uh, that moonshine has figured very prominently, uh, in those in the, uh, in the two thousands. Uh, another thing that's happened is that the, uh, you know, the making of, uh, I won't point to, uh, anyone in the audience, but, uh, uh but the, uh, home production of moonshine on, a small scale, or, or and in some cases on a uh, on a large scale, and uh, you know there's there's all kinds of availability of stuff with the internet. There's all kind of availability of recipes, of supplies, of equipment to make moon uh, moonshine. You can actually own a moonshine still. You just can't legally use it to make moonshine. Uh, and so um, you know, and so it's, it, it, the knowledge is more available and the equipment is more available than it ever has been. And there, there are a lot of people that are generally making pretty horrible stuff on their stovetop or in a backyard still. Although I will say that I have uh, had some, tasted some that was made in a backyard still by a couple of um, 20 somethings. Uh, in the Asheville area that was really good, <laughs> but uh, uh, roommates of, of, uh, of a student. Uh, but, uh, and then the third thing that has happened uh, is the rise of so-called um, legal moonshine. Uh, and then, um, and you know, there, there was no liquor made in North Carolina legally until I think it was about 2005 where the legislature changed the laws and allowed for um, small batch, uh, I guess you call it craft uh, distilling. The first um, person to take advantage of this was a guy who was an R.J. Reynolds, um, I think he worked in advertising in R.J. Reynolds, but he um, started uh, Piedmont Distillers and uh, just north of Winston-Salem and uh, in, in Madison, North Carolina, not Madison County, but Madison, town of Madison. And then he, he made something called, uh, I think it was Carolina Cat Daddy was his first product, but then the business really took off when he partnered with Junior Johnson uh, to make Junior Johnson's Midnight Moon, which is probably one of the best selling varieties of this uh, of this quote legal moonshine there are people that say uh if it's legal it ain't moonshine and that's you know so there is kind of a you know i don't know what you call it there you know because of, by definition if it's moonshine it's illegal but again this is um and i really couldn't keep up because i did the last chapter on this and i really couldn't keep up with all the new uh, distilleries that were popping up in North Carolina making this. And so it's, it's, it's really, um, all over the state. Uh, and, uh, there were at least 20 or so, uh, when I was looking at that, you know, a little over a year ago, and they're probably, you know, five, at least five or 10 more, uh, of these in the state now. So, um, uh, Asheville area of course has a couple of these. If you see, uh, you may recognize on the left, Troy Ball uh, of Troy and Sons Distillery or Asheville Distillery, which is, um, they have a incredible uh, high tech, beautiful uh, German built still uh, over um, in the Highland Brewing building right next to the main uh, tasting room there at Highland Brewing. And I think on Fridays they do tours, but, uh, but uh, been very successful, kind of a high, uh, high end moonshine, you know. And so Troy has a, a fascinating story about living out in, in Leicester area and getting to know some local moonshiners and thinking, you know, well, this is something, this is American vodka in many ways and is a great mixer for mixed drinks. And she's been very successful with this business. And then another one is. Howling Moon, uh, which uh, um, I take some pride in. Actually, everything I know about actually making moonshine, I learned from uh, Cody Bradford, who's the founder and owner of Howling Moon. Cody was a, uh, a history major at UNC Asheville. And, um, 
uh, and has it still over in uh, in Woodfin. You would know know it, but it's in the basement of a old house. But uh, but he's done very well with this Howling Moon variety. Has won a number of awards, and it's uh, available in a number of states. You know, I think um, Junior Johnson's Midnight Moon is, I think, in maybe all fifty states. But uh, but again, this is something so so. Um, Moonshine's very much alive and well uh, right now. And it's a pretty amazing thing um, uh, to see what the impact has been uh, on this state. Uh, and again, I, actually, I should have shared this. Uh, I, had a, uh, I did a talk down in uh, Albemarle a couple of months ago before everything shut down. And I was joking about the... Uh, you know, I've always had a bone to pick with North Carolina license tags about the first in flight thing that, you know, why can't we do any, any better than that than to claim a couple of Ohio guys as our most significant thing. And so I've, I've proposed uh, that we ought to have a first in moonshine license tag. So uh, I got an email from a guy and he had made up a thing, um, uh, a first in moonshine. Maybe I, I, I can see if I can share that. Uh, uh, in a minute on my screen, but uh, yeah, I need to uh, I need to throw that into the PowerPoint because I'm kind of kind of proud. It's got my name on it uh, too, so so that's been my proposal. So, but again, very much still with us in North Carolina. You know whether we should be proud of it or not. I'll I'll leave that to you. But but definitely we have been. Um, you know, it, if not first in flight uh, or first in freedom, we definitely been first in moonshine. So, uh, all right, well, um, we got some questions uh, here. Yeah, just a quick reminder that if you have a question, you can send it to either everyone or uh, Dan privately in the chat. And I, and I may mention, someone mentioned Thunder Road. Uh, that's a fact that I've got a big section on Thunder Road. Uh, and that's just such an interesting thing. Of course, in the movie, you know, where uh, uh, Lucas Doolin is living is Kentucky and then he's hauling liquor into Tennessee. But, uh, but that, that movie was, was all filmed in um, primarily in Buncombe County, some in Transylvania County. Uh, as well, but uh, it's really interesting to watch that movie and and uh, uh, and still lots of sites that you can recognize from the area. Uh, and uh, Robert Mitchum evidently did have a real taste for moonshine and uh, made quite a splash while he was here uh, in Buncombe County. Dan, do you mind to talk a little bit about Betty Sims? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Betty Sims is one of my, there's a, she's in my hall of fame and Betty Sims is just, uh, you know, when I came across, you know, when you're doing historical research, you know, it can be pretty boring at times, you know, cause you're going through things and then all of a sudden you hit something that just blows you away. And so when I came across Betty Sims, I just like, I, it was just like, you could not make this stuff up. So, but Betty Sims was a woman in Polk County uh, in the early years of the 20th century, I think about 1903 is when she came to fame, I guess you would say. Uh, and so uh, she was evidently, she was uh, head of kind of a big, big time moonshine operation. And uh, she got busted uh, with several barrels of liquor uh, uh, right on the South Carolina line. And so they hauled her into federal court in Polk County. And uh, first day of court, uh, she comes in, she's got this fancy blue silk dress on and this matching hat and all this stuff. And, and it's the Charlotte Observer is there covering uh, court and that just the descriptions are incredible. And of course, you know, anytime it's women, you know, there's, there's always, even to this day, there's this obligation to describe their looks and what they're wearing and all this stuff, you know, that they don't do with men. It's, I never quite understood that, but again, there's all this description about how uh, this fancy dress she's wearing and, and, um, her looks, you know, evidently she was very attractive. Although, uh, you know, one of the, uh, 
um, things, I guess, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm fishing for a word here, uh, accoutrements uh, to her outfit was that she had what they called a toothbrush in her mouth. And I thought, why don't you have a toothbrush? But then I thought about it and what that meant in 1903 was that she had a stick that they would kind of rough up that they would use to, to uh, dip in snuff. And so she had some snuff in her mouth, you know, and this toothbrush. Uh, and so she made quite a stir in court. Uh, her case didn't come up. She came back the next day, had another new dress on. And again, all this description about what she's wearing. <clears throat> uh, that day, though, the, uh, and I think there was a third day, another new dress, all this description. The third day, the judge, uh, and evidently her case was going to come up the next day but he, he made it clear that he was ready to crack down on people like Betty Sims and throw the book at her. So she did not appear uh, for the fourth day of court. So they, they sent the marshals out after and they, they uh, caught her, put her in jail uh, in, uh, there in Columbus. And uh, while she was in jail, she uh, uh, set fire to the jail uh, attempted to this, to escape, got in a fight. She, somehow she had a knife, uh, got in a fight with the jailer, cut him, uh, but he was able to knock her out and put out the fire and put her back in jail. Well, <laughs> the Charlotte Observer had a field day with this, and uh, uh, and I think it, it it referred to her as a daring uh, Amazoni, uh, Amazonian moonshiner, you know. So. Uh, you know, the headlines and everything were just incredible, you know, and, uh, um, and, um, um, and then, then she later did an interview with the Shaw Observer and said, I really, you know, that's, that's um, all exaggerated. I, I didn't set that fire, you know, and, and I was just, you know, standing there, you know, <laughs> innocently, you know, uh, 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 when this jailer attacked me. But, uh, but again, uh, you know, it's an example. That's a fairly extreme example. You don't see uh, a lot of women like Betty Sims. But, uh, but uh, and, and again, one of the important things about Betty Sims, though, is that as the story went on, it, it, it um, you know, she fits the classic image because she was, her husband had abandoned her. She had, I think, three small children. And uh, she's the sole provider for her her family. And so again, it's kind of acceptable in those circumstances. But like a lot of people, I, I, I tried, you know, uh, lots of ways through newspapers, through um, using ancestry and stuff to track her down. And I could not find any evidence uh, or, or anything about her uh, after all this happened. So I, probably what happened was that she, um, she ended up remarrying probably. And, uh, and lived a respectable life after, uh, uh, after this. And uh, that's what a lot of people did. They, you know, most people were not career moonshiners. They were doing it, you know, um, to help them get through a particular season of life, you know, that they needed, that this was one of the few ways that they could make some real income. And so, but Betty was really good at it. And, and she presented quite the uh, image of the, female moonshiner in the early 20th century. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things in the book is <laughs> it was reading about Betty Sims. Um, if, if, you know, when you're a historian, especially when you work at historic sites, when I was advanced, people would ask me all the time, don't you want to go back in time? Um, you know, no, most of the time, but if I had to, I think I'd like to go back as Betty Sims. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, Catherine. I can see that. Uh, I would love to meet Betty Sims. I tell you, you know, she's one of those that you would definitely want to sit down and have a have a, uh, a long conversation with. Right. There's a there's a series of paperbacks there. I feel it. So <laughs> well, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Well, are there any other questions here? Doesn't look like it. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, yes, this program will be available online to view later. Yeah, so um, I, I would say probably about 3.30, 4 o'clock this afternoon is when it'll be up on our Facebook page and also on YouTube, um, so you can watch it later.
Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate well, yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are interested in moonshine, um, the North Carolina Room has a lot of different sources. Um, if you have the book, um, flip through it, you'll see how many pictures we sent to Dan. And of course, um, Gene Hyde is on here too. He is the archivist at UNC Asheville. And um, I don't know, have, have your NASCAR interviews been transcribed, Dan? Yes. Yes. So yes. you can go read his um, huge, wonderful cache of interviews with um, some NASCAR heroes. So, uh, but if you have any questions about our next program or how to get in touch with North Carolina Room or other archival sources in the area, um, either get in touch with us via Facebook or our general catch all email account is pacnc at buncombecounty.org. All right, so thanks everybody.